What's happening? Hey, it's Steve Maeda. We're live here with Damien Dieka, who's in Sydney, Australia. And you do a lot of stuff, but how I met you was through the 21 convention. You gave a speech that talked about a lot of stuff, but mainly happiness. And I run these groups uh, through my, uh, my programs. And uh, people, when that video hit live, because all the 21 convention videos took a little while to get up there on the feed, and yours hit probably a year after you had given the speech, man, a bunch of guys in my group were enormously responsive to that, about happiness, about how you presented yourself, and how it was refreshing to hear somebody uh, that had had experience with women, dating, lifestyle, that wasn't giving a message that was all crazy. And from there, you know, we spoke, we hung out, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's been over a year now and we're, we've been like, man, we should do some sort of podcast and get together. How would you introduce yourself, man? Because you, you have so many things going on. It's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's a bit full on in it. So, you know, yeah, I run a dating coaching company, but I'm also a life coach. Uh, but my passion, my passion lies with psychology and human behavior. So, you know, I'm not a psychologist, you know, I'll say that up front, but it's an area of, I mean, I'm a, I'm a prolific reader and researcher. Like, I go nuts. It's the one thing I think you've noticed. It's yeah. one of the reasons we, we got together is I'm nuts for stats and information and, and the truth and, and what, what the scientific information really shows about men, about women, about how to be happy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so what am I? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a guy who's passionate about helping people improve themselves. So in this topic, like, first off, let me just say, I think you're a dude that could come on a lot of different interviews in a, a you know, TSL podcast that we do or, uh, or whatever it is. So I'd like to have you on more and more just to talk about things. But on this one, we decided to focus on men's issues. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what to title it because it's such a heated thing. But men's rights, men's empowerment, men's, men's focus groups um, – this is something that has been a big part of what I wanted to move towards. I reached out to you on it, and you were saying, man, that's one of the things I'm really passionate about, and I'm starting to do these groups in, in Sydney with it and all over Australia. But let's talk about that, and let's talk about what that means to you, because you have an interesting perspective. One of the first things you said was, hey, let's make this clear. This is not about bashing women or denying feminism or anything like that. What's your uh, definition or perspective on men's rights? Yeah, right. Well, I mean, look, yeah, absolutely. As you said, it's not about, it's not, we're not trying to play a, a blame game. Um, you know, we've just, we're in a situation now where we've kind of had decades of, many decades of the feminist movement fighting for the rights of women, but rightfully so, you know, not in a bad way for the most part. Um, but what's happened as a result is men haven't been speaking up. Men haven't been fighting for their side of the rights um, profile nearly as loudly as frequently as women and what's happened is we've ended up in a situation where we're skewed and that's not really women's fault it really we only have ourselves to blame you know if we're going to blame someone it's ourselves right um but in a situation like this and one of the reasons i'm so passionate about it is that we 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 are the most to blame if we don't do anything about it if we don't say anything about it if we don't educate men about all right things have swung in this direction and things need to be equalized um and you know, the funny thing is most women that I meet, they want things to be fair as well. I rarely meet a woman who says, um, who says or thinks in a very militant way that men have to be pushed down, that they have to be squashed, that women really, really want men to have their say as well for the yeah. most part. We're definitely not fighting them. I think a number of guys think of, you know, the very stereotypical feminist who's, uh, you know, kind of like angry, anti-man, you know, doesn't shave her armpits and... <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah. But that's not it. That that's really not what women are. You know, they want men. They want men and themselves to live happily ever after. Um, right. But we have to speak up. It's it's our it's our duty to speak up. It's not women's duty to say, "Men, what would you like to say on the matter?" Yeah, you know. You, you know, I think what's interesting with this is that in order for people to be happy, for men and women to be happy in our world that we live in today, men and women need to be a true expression of who we are. Like, mm -hmm. and it's so weird because equality can be debated of such a loaded word where people like revolt against then build up all this, you know, it's become a good thing and a bad thing because, uh, you know, let's say uh, there might be some really angry men out there saying that when women are fighting for equality or vice versa, you know, really angry women out there that say when men are fighting for equality, it creates an imbalance. 
But for people to just be expressions of themselves and be what a man is supposed to be, be what a, a woman is supposed to be, defined by that person, that's how we're going to be happy. You know, but the more we regulate and set rules and all that sort of stuff, man, things get crazy. But when it comes to men's perspectives, men's rights, all that sort of stuff, what is the problem? You know, what are you seeing as part of the problem, uh, you know, today? Um, that's, a, <laughs> that's a loaded question. <laughs> so, well, yeah, yeah. we talked about I'll start that. from the beginning the way I see it, uh, I guess. Um, you know, in, in what was really popular, uh, feminism hit its peak in the 70s, mm -hmm. right? And what was, what was kind of the, the, the thing at that point from the scientific community, psychologically speaking, was that men and women, we are the same. Um, we are exactly the same except that we have different sort of sexual parts. Right. But that um, society teaches us to be boys or girls yeah, as far as our behaviors is concerned. Right. And that was what the scientific community believed in, at that time. Um, and, and we now know that today to be really quite quite outrageously incorrect. I mean, society plays a role in our behaviors, of course, but there's a massive genetic and, like, and in that regard, hormonal component that changes how we're wired, how we're, how we're, how we're emotionally shaped as we, as we grow up. Um, that means that men and women are always going to be different. Right. And to me, until we accept that it's okay for men and women to be different, not better or worse, you know, not, not, you know, neither party should be a, a second-rate citizen, but that we are going to be different, that through life, on the whole, men will tend to, to make certain types of decisions. Women will tend to make other types of decisions. Yeah. And even then, there's a whole lot of gray area in between because no one really perfectly fits the archetype. Yeah. But until we actually accept that, that we're supposed to be different to some degree, we can't really move forwards. Um, because otherwise, you've got men constantly pushing against what they feel they really are and you mentioned this before, man, is, is you've you got to be who you are, whatever that is, inst instinctually, like at your core, you've got to be that. And society pushes men to be something different. Um, you know, what that is, we can talk about as we go on today. But the same thing for women, you know, I know, because I, I coach women as well. Yeah. And the one thing I notice with women is that it's, it's, it, in some ways it's even worse for them is they're, they're supposed to be, um, they're supposed to be the mom, the good mom. They're also supposed to be great in bed um, and be a bit of a vixen. Uh, and they're supposed to be really good in the kitchen and they're supposed to work really hard and have a career, a full-time career. And if they can't maintain all that, then they're not a real woman, yeah. which, is, which is really two or three jobs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, but it's the same thing for guys. You know, we are, we are so scared of our sexuality, you know, as a, one, as a whole, you know, men, are, we're taught, you know, if you see a girl and you have like this really kinky, lascivious thoughts about her, then you better bury that shit really deeply down and, uh, and, and you better not speak of it and you better pretend like it never happened. <laughs> right, right, right. Hold well, on, I'm going to hit a white balance here again. See if yeah, I yeah. Get, oh, yeah, there I am, back to color. <laughs> Awoken from the dead. But, man, see, this is what's so important and I think that especially with my groups because we have like 90% men, 10% women and we're working on balancing that out but how the sexual life started was, to, uh, was mainly a, you know, a men's thing. And mm -hmm. I am big time on groups. I'm big time on people talking. And I'm big time on, uh, this may sound odd from a coaching perspective, but taking the authority, the authoritarian approach out of it and making it more like a community where we're really enriched to work with each other. So everybody's an equal when we start working within, within my groups. And mm -hmm. when we get that, what we've come to discover with like our philosophies that we explore and, and the different principles that we work from is that man there are some beautiful things to you being an expression of your own sexuality when we're following rules of society we can't do that or, or like you know you have to live within society of course you know there's great benefits mm -hmm. of society i don't want to say that it's a, a horrible thing and in reality man we, we're living within it so we have to make it function but when we start regulating things of what a man is supposed to be, what a woman is supposed to be, and we look to that rather than within ourselves, that's when things start to get conflicted. And being a dating coach for so long and myself and working with people, man, you see sexuality be such a screwed up thing. The answer, mm -hmm. if, if a guy comes to me and he says he wants to date better women, women, have a better sex life, uh, just know how to be a good date, whatever it is, or, or have a, a, a crazy and wild sexual adventure... The answer is, is you come up with a definition for yourself, live it and go for it and figure out how to do that because that's the only way you're going to learn if it really is right or wrong for you. 
But we're taught to do that by living in archetypes. And only for, in, or, in order for me or a potential client or whatever to have a good sex life, you need to be like another person. And that's a terrible, terrible idea. But I don't really see anybody, many people offering an idea outside of that, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it it's so rare. terrible. <laughs> but that's the direct problem there and where we're having these gender issues in order for you to be a man. You have to have these traits. You have to have the alpha traits. In order for you to be a woman, you have to have these traits. If you're going to be a vixen, you know, if you're going to be a, a woman that's going to have a relationship, you have to have these qualities. And in reality, what we have to do is have a relationship with ourself, that quality or principle, and then learn how to communicate that to the world. You know, I think that that is an important deal. Um, as we're going to go deeper in this stuff, I'd like to ask you some questions about the dating industry because uh, yeah. we had also talked about that as well. And I think you and I hit on some good areas. In fact, I emailed out to my groups. There's about 200 guys that are a part of my, my inner groups that, that we talk and intera interact with. Um, and I said, hey, I'm going to interview this guy. You know, Some of you guys know him. Here's his 21 convention video links. Um, what, what should I ask him? And what, one of the guys actually had brought up he's like well he brings up authenticity and being natural but then there's a day game approach with all this sort of stuff and and he didn't really i don't think he examined all of your stuff you know sure, sure. It, it was more like uh you know the tagline of a day game coach or a, a pua coach and then an authentic and natural guy and he wasn't a native english speaker guy either but what is your approach on the whole industry of dating uh seduction pickup what's your take on it yeah, sure. So, I mean, when it comes, I mean, look, one thing everyone, I guess, has heard about for a long time anyway is this, this constant beating over the head of, you know, attracting women is an art form, it's not an exact science, blah, 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 blah. But as a result, it also means that there's more than one way to approach girls, there's more than one way to talk to them and interact with them. And mm -hmm. What I've noticed of, um, you know, the pickup industry as a whole, and of course, that's, that's a very big bucket that I'm creating and I'm making a generalization. Um, but what I notice, especially with you know, in the last 10 years what was going on is that guys were being taught to kind of manipulate and play games and, and, and you know, um, use people's self-esteem against them um, to, to pick up women. And, and you know, it, look, it's, it's a strategy that works, but it works with a very limited sort of uh, spectrum of the population. So if I want to play games and manipulate to pick up women, I can pick up really hot women, but there is a, there is a spectrum of women I'll never get anywhere near. And that spectrum of women is really what I call high-quality women. In other words, women with a high self-esteem, women who are really confident, who are going places, who know who they are, who know what they stand for. Um, you know, the type of women you actually want to not just sleep with, but, you know, kind of meet someone decent to actually settle down with and do all that stuff. If you're playing games, that woman is going to shut you down so hard. I mean, my partner, I remember the night I met her, I watched another guy approach her with a really kind of old school line, you know, it was like an opinion opener. Hey, can I just ask you a question on something? You know, um, and, and, and she looked at him and she, could, she knew it was a line. She'd never learned any pickups. So right, right. BS. And she just said to him, look, don't you have friends you can ask that question of? Why did you come to me? And the guy's like, oh, well, I, um, I, uh, um, you know, did you want to just answer the question? She's like, no, not really. <laughs> and he walked away. <laughs> Now, you know, my, my partner can be a bit of a ball busser when she senses BS, but that's the thing. Women of quality, you know, guys will say, oh, that, that chick was just a bitch. But it's not that simple. It's she smells you're giving a BS, and she's going to give you crap for it. Yeah. And yeah. So, so in my mind, you know, to kind of bring everything back and answer that question, if you, you can approach a woman being yourself, being really authentic, really genuine. You know, you're not playing games. You're not trying to beat around the bush. You're just going up and, and with your, you know, this is not necessarily exactly what you're saying, but everything you're doing says, I'm a guy, I like you, I want to find out about you, where are we at? You know, right. and that's, that's, you're not lying, you're not cheating, you're manipulating, you're not manipulating, you are walking up to a woman, you're, you're learning to make her laugh, you are learning to, to build rapport with her on real topics, things you both actually care about and give a damn about. Mm -hmm. You know, if you find a chick who, who she's into tattoos and wild parties and, and, and smoking, uh, smoking crack, and you're into, like, chilling out on the beach, reading books and meditating, you shouldn't want to pick her up in the first place. You know, that's, so that's really my, that's where I come at it from. If, if, if you know how to make a woman laugh and you know how to share passions and build connection with someone, 
Um, you know, and you, you know how to be confident. You don't need to play games. You don't need to manipulate. You don't need to be anything but authentic. And a lot of guys really miss that point along the way because they get taught that mantra of guys can either be a, a nice guy or an asshole. And nice holes get laid, so let's let's mimic assholes. Um, but that's not it. And that's kind of that's also part of being a man is that. You know, the nice guy is what we call all heart and no spine, right? Yeah. He's got, yeah. He can't stand up for himself. Women yeah. can't respect that. And right. an asshole is all spine and no heart. And women would rather a man who's got spine than a man who, who has no spine. So he'll get laid. But a real man is a guy who's got both. You know, he's sensitive, he's open, but he's got backbone. He can stand up for himself. He's not going to take crap from a woman. He's not going to take crap from anyone, not just a woman. But anyone who's going to put him down or who, who isn't right for him, he's got no time for that. He's got he's got a high self esteem. Yeah, and the, potentially all this discussion may be food for yet another podcast. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, this is this is what I do, and this is yeah. clearly what you've done a lot of, and yeah. you know, still do as well as many other things. But man, what I really think is like, I can be a non quality guy, I can be a good quality guy, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sync up with. <laughs> the state I'm at, if I'm being my non-quality self, which is based on, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff and, and uh, really reliant on running from the fear of who I am, running from the rejections of, that might come from me being me, it's not going to be good. And the only chance that I've had, because I've had every type of relationship, I've had good ones, I've had bad, bad ones, I've seen a lot of consequences of, you know, different types of relationships and, and every, everything that I could imagine that I wanted, I went for. And I feel that I've gotten um, when, when it comes to sex and relationships and that had nothing to do with what made me happy. That had nothing to do with what gave me functionality in relationships and maybe nothing may be the wrong word for that, but it had so little to do with all of that. And what had so much to do with it was where I was at working on myself and learning how to communicate that to other people. Um, but man, you bring up, you know, this idea of being a man, having a backbone, um, having some sensitivity to you, what is your viewpoint on you know being a man? What is being a man? What makes men different? You mean as opposed to from women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, again, you know, it's it's a big it's a big question. But one of the things that I'll, I say, and and you know, I'll preface this. You know, this isn't uh, this isn't really my material. As in, I take this from fantastic. Um, authors, fantastic instructors that right. I've worked with over the years, of course. But really, the big thing is that men like to be straightforward. So we like simplicity. We like emptiness. We like freedom. Um, and what do I mean by all that? What I mean is that if you look at a little boy, and a little boy uh, sees another little boy with a toy he wants, what a little boy will do is walk over and say, hey, I want that toy. Right. We don't use words. We don't do anything strange. We don't kind of play games. We don't do anything like that. All we do is we, we see what we want and we go for it. And we say, this is what I want. If you watch two little girls and one little girl has, has a toy and the other one doesn't and she wants that toy, she will do one of two things. She will walk over to that girl and she will negotiate a way in which they can both share that toy. <laughs> or she will walk somewhere else and she will... Um, have a whole lot of fun doing something else and, and draw the other girl over to her instead. And then she can walk over and have the toy. Hmm. Um, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to create an argument of all women are supposed to be manipulative and playing games. Yeah, and I think but, that's important because yeah. people get caught up in that. Like somehow Damien Dieck has now made a rule. and a, No, it's not that. Anyway, yeah. go on. Go on yeah. yeah, no, it's definitely not at all. But all I'm trying to do is create this contrast of already at such a young age Girls are negotiators and, 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 and they, they will uh, use language and, and structure relationships to get a mutual outcome, which is a very smart strategy. Boys are much more impulsive. They're much more, um, they, we like to be straightforward. And mm -hmm. society often teaches us to be very verbose, be very dance around the point when we want something. Um, they teach us to, um, um, they teach us in many ways to do things to negotiate in the way women negotiate. Right. Now, this becomes a problem in a lot of areas, you know. Um, you know, imagine, again, a relationship is always the best place to, to kind of place this. Um, nothing feels better as a man than to be in an interaction with a woman. I don't care if you're starting a date or if you've just met her. And literally saying, 
yeah, this is what I want. This is like very clearly, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. This is what I want. To actually blurt it out and not dance around the bush and not try to do these other things around the edge feels incredibly masculine. Right. It gives you this real uh, feeling when you're just really upfront about what you want with people. Um, you know, to be masculine is a heck of a lot more than that. Because to be masculine, we have a massive amount of testosterone. So to be masculine is to be plagued by this constant um, sexual arousal slash aggressive, aggressive um, tendencies slash, you know, we have this really dark part of ourselves that, that will kill, or that will be willing to kill. And to be masculine, to be a man, is actually to be aware of and comfortable and in control of these parts of ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I always talk to guys when we go through sex and sexuality, which to me is really a definition of so many things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, the sexual life to me means like everything is sexual. When two things come together, two different things come together, they create a new thing, whether that mm -hmm. could be the obvious life or it could be emotions. It could be uh, j just so much changes, the dynamic. And I really think when, when connection happens, it's a beautiful thing. And um, that is not limited to men and women. Anyway, I get all into the philosophy. That's limited. That that's everything, how everything interacts. Yeah. Um, but what's so interesting when we explore sexuality, I say, look at yourself, you know, what makes you a man? What makes you your sex? You know, uh, for instance, you know, my, my girlfriend is pregnant and we just found out, you know, they were saying, Congratulations, we're going to, by yeah, Hey, no, it's awesome. Man. <laughs> they said, we're gonna, we're gonna sex the baby, you know? And so, uh, we're having a boy. We just found out yesterday as, uh, pretty amazing it's really unreal man the science behind it and you know seeing him move and it was, yeah. it was freaking surreal man but um anyway uh in that it's like what is the sex you know and at first it's like penis and vagina you know that's that's the basic bare bones like simple thing but in that there's different urges there's different uh, motivations. There's different ways of thinking. There's different ways of learning, all which, you know, can be seen as there's some male ways, and mm -hmm. there's some female ways. And one of the things that we've been bouncing around with TSL is that every sex is capable of doing the other sex's stuff. All right. Yeah. yeah. But the perhaps instinct, or I, I forget. Like I said, man, this. This thing that I founded but has become bigger than me. And I forget what some of the guys were saying, but they got all philosophical with it. But each sex is capable of the other sex. But yeah. the, the instinct, um, you know, starts off in a different place. And I think that that's very important. And my sexuality, you know, whether I look at it, my urge, whether I look at it, my pattern, whether I look at what my emotions are in it, my mentality is in it, is very important and very unique. But... If I am ashamed to feel like my definition of a man or my definition of sexuality, then it, I start compensating. I start compromising who I am. I start taking away things, adding things that don't work. I'm afraid to say that that chick's hot because that might be a, you know, attacking. That might be a bad mentality. This might be yeah, yeah, <laughs> sexual objectification. You know, uh, we're getting into rape culture, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I, I think that. Those things are valid, but if you don't know what they mean for you, if you don't know, uh, like whenever anybody is objectified to be an object and then truly treated in that way, that's bad. But mm. part of a desire is, is sexual, man. In fact, that has nothing to do with objectification. It has to do with like, man, that, that chick is fucking hot. I cannot, that is hot. I am sexually inspired towards that. That's a, that's a part of me. My sexual yeah. mind is different than my logical mind. And we're caught up trying to have a logical discussion about sexuality. And now all these people are making rules about sex and gender without taking into consideration how people think, feel, uh, share emotion, communicate, and actually have sex when they're aroused. And mm. uh, it's too bad. Anyway, um, <laughs> that all being said, do you have any thoughts on being a man, what makes you different from being a woman in terms of of the raw sexual aspect of it, like how that affects them, I guess in, well, let's keep it simple. Um, cause this, this again is kind of a loaded question, but how men and women are different based on how they court or communicate or flirt. 
Yeah, well, I mean, look, the interesting thing is that both sexes notice sexual cues straight away, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even the research says the same thing. Both sexes, men and women, if they see a member of the opposite sex that's hot, they'll both go, huh, they've got my attention. But one of the big, obviously, the, the big straight-up differences is guys is, and that pull is a lot stronger. You know, for guys, you know, it's also to do with our mating strategy and, and, and all that stuff, you know, and that we never have to worry about pregnancy. Our first pull is towards something sexual. Yeah. And, and that is, that's a strong pull. And, and it doesn't matter who you are, that's going to be a piece of the seduction puzzle. You know, when I coach women, they need to understand this too. They need to understand that if a man sees a woman as asexual, it's almost impossible for him to get interested in her emotionally, if that makes sense. It's, it's quite yeah. a hard thing for a man to do. For a woman, that's not necessarily a barrier. So, you know, men have, we, we get quite locked. <laughs> you know, it's, here's, this is actually interesting. If you have ever seen uh, gay men interact yeah. and then gay I women have. interact, it's two very, very different things. <laughs> and they're both sexual. They're both like, yeah. you know, they, they both achieve a level of sexual, being sexually healthy together. And, but it's totally different communications. And, and it, I mean, it's, it, it's just a night and day difference. And then when you see heterosexuality come together, it's like, it's the conflicts of those two things trying to communicate. It's, it's pretty nuts, you know? <laughs> but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's this, I mean, you know, there is this natural, and I believe it's completely natural, by the way. Um, there's this natural competition between men trying to have sex. And by the way, men, um, for men, very often sex is, 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 is an important part in the falling in love with someone. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of research to suggest that men fall in love quicker than women, which I think would surprise a lot of people. Yeah, I could, but I could anyway, see that. Men see, yeah, and men see that as a necessary part of that process. Um, um, you know, we get, even in relationships, we get love through sex. You know, it's, uh, it totally. sounds stupid. Man, it's you're, not, yeah. th let me just, uh, sorry to yeah. interrupt. I want you to continue on it, but you're one of the only people I've heard say that. Whereas men, when they're sexually aroused and having sex, feel the emotions. Whereas when we're not, um, it, it's before sex and before we've had sex with that person, it's like we can't connect uh, on mm -hmm. that same level. See, I've always thought men and women are the same. It's just we go through different processes in the, in the process of courtship, dating, arousal, yeah. all that sort of stuff in different areas. When men get aroused, there's a, they're aroused. You know, they're, they they want to have sex. They, uh, you know, they have this overwhelming physical urge. I believe women do too. However, yeah. there's also you know, this caution, thinking things through. You know, what is this? All this sort of stuff. And, and you'll... Uh, you know, you're, you're interacting with a, a woman who is clearly physically aroused, you know, if she likes you, if you like her and she likes you, but mm -hmm. she also has some caution. It's got to be unique. It's got to be, what is this happening here? You know, is this real? And, um, you know, how we talk about escalation, because once again, in TSL, sex is such a big thing. Escalation is how do we communicate within that? How do we, you know, mm -hmm. the resistance that we get from women uh, is, is a good thing. It means we're on the right path. Because it, that's part of her process. But guess what, guys? You're going to have resistance after you start to have sex. As soon as you start to have sex, as soon as that happens, the emotion kicks in, the doubts. And, and here's the thing, man. It's so funny because if you talk to women who are really sexually active and are not committed to a relationship, if they have sex with a guy, and I don't know if this has happened to you, but it's happened to me too. A girl has sex with you. It's good. You're like, man, this is awesome. And, and then as soon as you're done, she's like, okay, cool, I'm going to go. Or, like, let's go do whatever. She, she d doesn't, like, you know, want the emotional courtship afterwards. Every guy hearing this is going to say, uh, it's bullshit. Or most guys, right? <laughs> but, man, let me tell you, I, when I talk to women who are sexually active, who are very, you know, not looking to get anything tied down, and they're just going through that yeah. phase, or maybe that's their entire personality, they will tell you straight up, they're like, how come these guys, like, take all these stereotypical women trait, female traits of, you know, wanting all this girl stuff. Like, oh, I want you to, you know, hold, give me some attention. And it's just so ridiculous. And, and it's like, well, what happens right after you have sex? And like, well, we have sex and I do what every guy wants. I get up and leave. <laughs> yeah, I get it. And it's, it's like, okay, I'll call you when I call you and it's all good. And, you know, it's somehow like if through that process, 
we we become once again equals man you know we yeah. become the same thing it's crazy you know it's it's really a cool thing but yeah men and women don't get how similar they are but mm-hmm. it, i feel it's just different steps of the process anyway i didn't mean to interrupt but i love hearing that because so few people point that out so few people and especially in the seduction community i almost want to say should never take sex advice from somebody in the pickup community because it's so <laughs> flawed it's so yeah. wrong it's so screwed up and from this fucked up perspective that is it is really is screwed and then in the scientific community one of the problems with that is there's just not enough experience of people having sex so there's got to be this yeah. merging of communication as long as people aren't talking about it, there's no communication so when you're saying men feel emotion through sex, I just had to chime in there. Go on. I'm going to white balance again. <laughs> yeah, you're man. You know, I, I don't even remember what I was talking about at that point. You were talking about I something saying, awesome. but <laughs> Damn straight. I was saying, what was that? Yeah, I was saying, yeah, okay, so men, I mean, men, we, we feel like we connect through sex. Yeah. See, that's part of the thing. If, if, uh, if, if we feel unsure about our woman, if we feel like we need love from her, what do we do? We, we go to have sex with her if we're in a relationship. Mm-hmm. It's, it's actually a piece of it. Um, so it's very different. It's very different between men and women. I can't remember where I was going with that. I'll, I'll be honest. So, so maybe we should go on. I'll come yeah, back. To yeah. Yeah. I think something with the differences of, you know, how men and women date and courtship and all that sort of stuff. But, um, how about this? Let's move on and let's go into some of these, these other questions because, um, I, I know we're talking a lot about dating and sex and we were supposed to talk all of this men's movement stuff, but how is it that men are disempowered in modern culture? Um, Man. Yeah, go on. Like what, what's affected, you know, by that disempowerment? Is it their self-image? Is it the relationship of a whole? Like how does it work? Because a lot of people might hear that. How are men disempowered in modern culture? got to be fucking, like so many of my female, female friends would be like, what an asshole thing to say. But really when we start to look at it, you know, there's some ways where it's like, man, Men are absolutely disempowered in modern culture. Yeah, I mean, it's it's huge. I mean, if we just look at you know like suicide rates, um, yeah, totally. you know, around the world, I was I was just looking it up so I'd have exact rates for you, you know. But if I look in the USA, right, you know, four and a half girls per hundred thousand people commit suicide every year, which is awful. But almost eighteen males per hundred thousand. So you know, you're talking about four or five times as many guys killing themselves every year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, to me, that's indicative of something. It's indicative of something going wrong. But, but where, where is it going wrong? It's, you know, to me, one of the big things I was researching recently is boys and girls developmentally, how, how we, we're different. And, and it really starts really early on. So if you look at a, at a male brain, they're actually structured differently, mm-hmm. you know. And one of the big differences is the way that a, you get a boy's attention is caught and held. So it actually requires a much greater stimulus to grab and hold a male, male's attention. That's 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 a that's a, a physiological thing. It's a higher threshold mm-hmm. to stimulus, external stimulus. Um, and when you have our attention, yeah, it, you require a higher stimulus to hold that attention. So a lot of that's to do with dealing with stress, dangerous situations, danger, blah blah blah. Historically, but it is what it is now. Um, and then you've got these classrooms that are set up in such a way where um, boys boys do best when they compete. Sports are a perfect example of that. When you're competing, when boys compete with each other, is when they work damn hard. And then, you know, boys, boys make a competition of everything, you know, right. like, you know, the last one there's a rotten egg, and I reckon I can pedal faster than right. you, and I reckon right. I can, you know, do more push-ups than you, and we compete. That's how we grow, right. and that's right. how we learn, and that's how we play as children right from the right. beginning. Uh, when you watch little girls, how do they learn? They learn by, by collaboration, talking and sharing of ideas, and, you know, exploring each other's viewpoints. Um, that little girls do that as children, but boys compete, and that's how we learn. But if you look at the school system and how it's set up, and I, I bring this up because just really, honestly, dude, that's this is where it starts for children. Mm-hmm. What is a school environment? It's an environment where you are pushed. You're not competing, especially in Australia and America. Com- competition is being knocked out of the system so that nobody feels like a loser. And you have a system where uh, classrooms are quiet and. What you do is you're supposed to collaborate on everything with the people around you and discuss as groups and think things through as groups. And this is how the education system works. Um, And this is a problem because boys, uh, not all boys, but many boys really suffer with this because this is alien to them. This is not how they grow. And so you get this notion that boys are bad because boys are hyperactive. And boys, boys cause more trouble in class. 
And boys are going to bug and pester each other in class, and that makes boys annoying to teach, so boys are bad. So from a very early age, what we start being taught is that, hey, I know you've got more testosterone, and I know you've got, you have a much higher need to create stimulation for yourself because the way your brain's structured, but you're a bad person as a result. And so what you end up with is you kind of end up with a 60% higher dropout rate of boys than girls through high school. You know, because right from the beginning, things are structured away from how we know, how we know boys work. And let me just chime in here. When you hear statistics, yeah. like a lot of my female friends may hear this, and, or, or even male friends, when we're looking yeah. at statistics like this, you might be like, ah, well, you know, whatever. That's just how people are. Number one, this wasn't how it always was. You know, no. men are not characteristic of committing more suicide than women. Number two, if we looked at this in terms of if this was with women, more women yeah. killing themselves, or let's say a particular a race. race. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's where you would be like, well, wait a minute. In the U.S. or in Australia, you know, uh, uh, African American. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, in the U.S., African Americans. Yeah. But you know, sure. they, we're we're committing suicide at that much of a higher rate. That's the that's the civil rights man. That's that's where people saw it as such a powerful thing that had to change, and mm. that's what's crazy. And the the other thing too is is what I think is so characteristic when you look at just how boys learn and how girls learn. I just know for myself with boys is that uh, yeah, there's much more exploration, there's much more adventure, much more hands-on. Once again, this is not to say that the other gender can't have these characteristics or is to be denied of it. But yeah. I think what's being said here is the, that the choice and empowerment of somebody's urge towards education needs to be looked at and facilitated. And as long as it's denied and seen as bad behavior, it's going to work towards poor self-image. Um, there was something that, uh, gosh, man, originally I heard this is very funny. It's from this crazy conservative right-wing radio show pundit. But he said, all the alpha males in modern age ended up in prison. And I was like, <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. You know, and it's one of those things where it's like, you know, here is this person who, uh, you know, clearly there people are in prison for a reason and all that sort of stuff. And that's a whole other issue because that system is, especially in America, has become such a capitalistic mm -hmm. venture. It's ridiculous. But, man, all of those people could have had a chance if we had a, a better way of learning, a better uh, societal image for different outlets. Mm -hmm. But the restriction, you know, of being a man, the, the restriction of certain outlets or of how you might want to learn or how you might want to uh, use your use your body, use your mind, use your emotion. Um, when those are halted, it goes crazy. In fact, I was talking to a guy who deals with uh, anger management and working with uh, people of all, the, you know, whether they're war veterans to uh, people in incarcerated uh, to people that, you know, maybe had a slight run of the law or to a higher degree. But he'll tell you, he's, he's like, man, I, I work with men you know, exclusively. And one of the characteristics of working with a man is that he needs to know, you know, the, the male mind and how it works. And he goes with much more of a sociological take on it. And it's really interesting. But he said, you know, if we hold a lion in captivity and that lion, you know, after years and years and years and years of working with a trainer ends up attacking and mauling his trainer, everybody understands you caged a lion. It's not supposed to live in that way. And he's like, yeah. that is what's happened to modern male culture is there's so much that's been caged and that doesn't know how to communicate. And it's just frustration and turns into chaos. And sadly, that ends up in violence, which is just this miscommunication. Violence is, you know, one person saying, I want this, the other person saying no, and then forcing it to happen. You know, it's, it's a disconnect. Or it comes in through, you know, inner violence or self-hatred and alienating yourself and isolating yourself from the culture. You know, these things that we were naturally made to do to connect, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's it, man. That's the real nature of human beings is to connect, to the urge to want to see another person and, and curiosity. And sure, there might be some fear around there, but man, we are social animals, brain structure, everything about us. Yeah. And now naturally it's seen as that there's disconnect. It's common for us to have these problems. And it's just really a sad thing when we have so much potential to... Uh, to communicate on these bigger ways. Anyway, man, yeah, so what are some of the other things? Because you're breaking down some statistics, you're breaking down some yeah, different yeah. ideas. Um, 
You know, a lot of people will say men have it easier in the career place or the mm. workplace. Um, but there's also studies showing that, you know. That yeah. I mean, you know, there's, the, there's all that talk about, you know, glass ceiling. Um, and, and it's an interesting thing because uh, there's a lot of different pieces of research that, that play into this whole idea. And this isn't really a way that men are hurt, but it's a way that we, we misconstrue what's really happening in the world around us by not understanding how different men and women are. And, mm -hmm. You know, one of those things is that, uh, you know, if you look at the number of hours that men and women work uh, in an average work week, 20% uh, of men work over um, 50 hours a week. Uh, and only 7% of women work over 50 hours a week. And, and this is said to, I don't know exactly how they calculate, but they suggest this, this accounts for 70 to 80% of the, of the glass ceiling or the, the, the income gap between men and women. Right. And, and one of the things that we don't realize is that there's a number of societal pressures forcing men to work themselves into the ground. It's not because women are lazy. They're not. Women are generally deciding to live better lives rather than earn more money. But there's a massive societal pressure on men to work themselves into the ground so that they can afford to send their kids to a better school, so that they can afford to buy their wives nicer things. And, you know, the men are seen to be the breadwinner. And society still feels, makes a lot of men feel small if they aren't, the, if they aren't bringing in a lot of money. There's a, this massive pressure on guys and not on women. So you get this, this, this thing that, with, that men, we choose jobs that are stressful. Any job with a high stress environment, women go nowhere near it. Basically. Rather than the actual result of yeah, make, yeah, 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 and so that's somehow you know, your definition of you know hard work and, and all that yeah. stuff is your definition of being a man. Yeah, exactly, and it's it's not it's not like hard work like work is a good thing. You know, work makes the person a better mm -hmm. person. No, it's it's that women generally, even if you look at, at university degrees, people things that people choose, men often when they they're asked why did you choose that degree. And I did the same thing. I went straight out of school, straight into engineering, did engineering and commerce, two degrees together. Why? Well, because there was money in it. I didn't really care about engineering. I didn't care about commerce. You talk to girls and, you've, you, you, and what degrees they tend to do. Um, obviously, there weren't nearly as many girls in engineering as there, were, as there are in, I don't know, psychology, law, other topics. Why did you get into this area? Because I, I like the idea of it. I'd like to study this. I'd like to do this with my life. Whereas for men, it still tends to be, I choose this because... It's going to make me money. So they put themselves in jobs like the really high stress jobs, as I said before, um, um, like stock traders is a perfect example. You're there on the floor. How many women are in that room? Two, three. How many men are there? A hundred. And the reason you get that is because of uh, you could say, well, men are going to push the women out. But I've seen interviews with female stock traders and they say it's great being a woman because you stand out like dog's balls. It's easy to get picked. The men aren't, right. aren't mean to you. They treat you like anyone else. Um, they don't, they don't, the women in there don't really say that the men push them out. But what happens is that it's just, it's high stress. And most women don't pick that. They would rather be happy uh, right. to live a good life for them. Because men, we just have all that pressure to take the tough work, to take the dangerous work. You know, um, um, men, men occupy, I think, 90% of the most dangerous jobs. Yeah. Uh, you know, mine work, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, we work in construction sites with exposed electrical outlets and, 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 and balconies without balustrade and we can fall off. And uh, you'd never find a woman. You'd never find a secretary walk, working in those conditions. You'd find a male labor working in those conditions. So we pick the dangerous jobs because they pay better because we're so money focused because or society Or perhaps it has a better, a better image. I mean, it may yeah. not be that it pays better. That's the fucked up thing yeah. about it, you know, it's that it <laughs> has true. an image. Like, yeah. I, I mean, man, I'll tell you this, just from pressure myself, you know, mm. like I have, uh, you know, I've had this business for a while, do my own thing, um, very happy with it. Now, in this relationship and in this family that we've created, it's like, all right, how does this happen? And you start to look at the archetypes. I mean, you can't help it. It's like, okay, well, you know, I need some help here. What do I look at? And the voicing of how to be a better man, whether it's like some drunk dude in a bar telling you or, uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey or whatever else really mm -hmm. comes down to this cultural voice of like, you got to, you got to man it up. You got to bust ass. You have to do this and that. And the, the, the pressure's on you to do whatever. Whereas in reality, I don't really see the cultural voice like doing anything about that failing or what it's going to do to make lives easier with, uh, you know, uh, family, kids, uh, you know, self-image and all that sort of stuff. But it's like somehow it's like 
you've got to you've got to bust ass you've got to step it up and so the pressure of that is like directionless you know and unless you're winning unless you're at the top unless you got the gold medal unless you got the prize or whatever you're uh you're not there you know you're you're constantly feeling that you have something to work towards and um mm-hmm. there's just not a lot of outlets there's there's so many different things too and um just to switch gears here too is that when it comes to an anthropo- an anthropological look at things um there have been many different societies where people have lived happy um mm-hmm. many different ways of living that just get on when we hear about them in western culture or modern culture whatever you want to call them is they seem absurd they seem you know disgusting they seem whatever but what we need to realize is the name of the game is to be happy and there have been matriarchal societies that have been very functional there have uh been societies where you know sex is with everybody and 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 all sorts of stuff in fact like when columbus hit uh the americas he hit with the arawaks who had a very different social and sexual life that he thought was so appalling but hop over a few islands and talk to the caribs and you have this like vicious warlike culture um that you know was more aggressive now who's to say one is functional or dysfunctional i'm sure in their island and in their society, they made stuff work. They had a sense of belonging. They had a sense of self. And what we're seeing in our society is the more people that come in, you know, the bigger the walls come up, the more we need fences, the more we need territories, the less people communicate, the less people talk to each other, and the more distant we become, and the more judgmental we become, and mm. need judgment in order to have intellect, diversity, and all this sort of stuff, which gets all the way up into this men's rights thing, this feminism thing, of that rather than it for unity, sex, two different things becoming one so it can become something new, it becomes our identity. Rather than me being me, I feel more comfortable being Steve, the men's rights guy. Or rather than, you know, some of my, my, well, actually, all my female friends that call themselves feminists are very cool, but then this weird stereotype of feminism comes through that, you know, is like angry and militant that you read about. (laughs) But... Personally, I don't really know many of those. I haven't met many no. of those in my life, you know. I only see them on Facebook, actually. Yes, That's when yeah. they come out. <laughs> it, it's like I don't – I've never really interacted with that. Like I have a little bit, but it's so slim. It's so slim. But when I see people start representing themselves as a cause, you know, rather than who they are or, you know, a belief in something without their life experience, you know, to – to sense it that's when i th- see things starting to get totally screwed up and that's where the need of women's rights came into play of like hey how do we facilitate our identity how do we empower this how do we look at it and then the need for now men's rights what we're talking about is like what does it mean to be a man like how can we assert this how can this be a better th- you know thing how how can we not look to society to define us and rather look at us you know how can we not feel bad about our sexuality our drive to do things maybe our um, maybe things might be more aggressive. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Maybe things are passive. That doesn't mean it's bad. So it's like, how can we move towards this? But um, once again, lost in the conversation, let's get back to this. But like, what are some of the, what's different about how men see the world and apply themselves? And uh, how can they really be proud of it? We touched on it a little bit, but how can we take pride in who we are? You know, what is the difference about, you know, a man may have more testosterone. Mm-hmm. A man may, uh, uh, this might be a good segue into the whole sexual objectification topic, but a man might, you know, look at women differently when, they're, when they see somebody hot, you know, with the traits that, 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 that arouse them. You know, what makes them who they are in, that, in those masculine traits? And what's a way that they can start being proud of that? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. Um, men are men are more alike um, in this in this sexual stuff than they than they know. And the biggest problem I find with men is that they never actually. Uh, this sounds really airy fairy, but they never share their thoughts. So I, I know, dude, I agree that, with you on that. But keep yeah, going, keep and, going. Yeah, yeah, man. That, and this is one of the big things when we do. When we run, because we run something totally unrelated to, to, to dating pickup, which is like men's groups, which is on the work of David Data and coaching men in their own right. um, masculinity. And 
one of the big aspects of that is them sharing really deep, dark stuff that's happening inside, you know. And one man may say, you know, I get this weird kind of thing in my head like I just – it's like a fantasy. Like I don't actually want to rape a woman, but it's this weird fantasy. Like mm. I just, I'd love to be mm. able to. I'd never do it. And you, mm. you know, he would never do it. This is right. a really placid guy. He's not an aggressive man at all. He'd never do. But he's sharing this this weird thing that's going on inside that he conflicts with. And you'll get two other guys go, "Oh my god, man, I yeah. get that. I, I totally." Yeah. And and men don't realize things like this. Like if that sort of feeling comes up, they they feel like, "Oh my god, that must mean I'm I'm a deep." Uh, deep down inside, I'm a rapist. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really crazy, but there are, I mean, that's just a, a little example. There are so many examples like that where we are, until we realize it, that that's being naturally man, if yeah. that makes sense. Until we realize that, hey, you know what, part of being a guy is to be going to have this really dark, sordid side to yourself. There's part of yourself that's going to think of sex, that's going to objectify women at mm -hmm. times, and it depends on how you define objectify, but it's yeah. going to do that. And uh, it's going to do lots of things that women are going to tell you in society that's evil, but that's just be, being part of being a guy. Uh, women still want their guys to be guys. Right. You know? um, to, totally. to me, yeah, so to answer the question, to me, a lot of it's to do with sharing. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, and I don't really want to bring it back to, to sort of pick up stuff, but a woman is horniest when she feels the most sexy. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing that makes a woman feel sexy is if a guy she, she likes desires her wants right. her, like really hungers for her. As long as it's the right guy, that makes her feel very aroused. For a woman to feel like desired, yeah, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and if guys are constantly shy and afraid and scared of that part of themselves, in other words, they've got to share it to understand how normal it is. And then literally, you know, I don't like the militant, a lot of that militant feminism stuff, but one thing they've got going is I'm a woman and I'm proud of that. Totally. You yeah. know, um, for women, yeah. it's kind of it's it's the same deal, but it's different. For women, it's the fact that they 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 are they can be crazy, emotionally crazy, all over the place, neurotic at times. But every woman feels like that. Every woman experiences that, but they don't share that because yeah. women are supposed to be normal, just like men, so to speak, and right. they're not. They're just yeah. different. So men, we've got this dark sexual side. That's a big part to being a man. And you know what? Sharing, getting together with other guys, and actually sharing that deep dark stuff, you'll be amazed, man. Yeah. Um, we, we're on the whole, we're just not that different. We share this dark side. And once you realize we've all got it and that's you know, a part of being a guy. The, I, I'm just going to chime in again here, man, because yeah, this is like the, where, you know, you and I don't talk all the time, but here's one of the big crossovers is the need mm -hmm. for men to communicate and share is fucking huge, man. And people don't realize that. And just to share that sort of stuff, or like it could be something, you know, that, take some courage to share it just might be like i just want to say it you know there's mm. something about like for instance if we're going to say something publicly or to a group of of men and women it might be inappropriate but when there's a group of men it can absolutely be appropriate because everybody would understand it um whether that's talking about life or it's talking about relationships with women so it could be saying something like that would be interpreted as this massively like judgmental and sexually objective, objectifying thing, or it could be something which is just so alien that women or a group of men and women wouldn't get, you know, there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. And the pride to take a stance and be a man should be, man, people should be voicing that and what that is. Now, what's mm -hmm. interesting when you brought up this idea of, uh, you know, dark sides and whatever, you know, I, I truly believe women have that too. Um, yeah. By saying that, that doesn't mean that women are like, you know, these secret whores and, you know, you know, women, women are everything. That women are. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like women, women have everything within them. I mean, it's just like you, you discover it. Yeah. It's not bad. You know, men have everything within them, but guys will always talk about, you know, this, well, women have this rape fantasy and it's so interesting because men have many fantasies about sex too. And mm. that being one of them, that does not mean, and see, here's the, the, fucking thing man it pisses me off because the more people limit communication about sex the less people will talk about it having yep. a rape fantasy is not rape having a rape yep. fantasy is not you actually going out and forcing somebody to do something while they're actively saying no actively fighting against you and you forcing a sexual act on that is not that it's not the action of that but the fantasy of that may happen and here's here's actually my history so my sex life and i was 
I talk like again, I have men's groups and we talk about this stuff too. And my sex life started out without my decisions being fulfilled. And my actual sexual activity started out with my girlfriend at the time being kidnapped and sexually assaulted. And it's, I mean, like I was a virgin or I was no longer a virgin for two weeks and this shit happened. And after that, it was like all confusion. Okay. So then I go through my life. I'm, I don't have relationships. I don't get it. It just, you know, it's a confusing situation, clearly mm-hmm. more confusing for her. And, um, the thing is, is that as I start to get sexually active, you know, I start watching pornography, which I, I actually don't have a problem with that. That's like another heated issue too. Um, but uh, I, I start to become sexually active. I watch porn. I'm going, man, I like this. Fuck. I'm, I'm like, I'm like the rapist that, you know, had, <laughs> you know, that ruin lives that do these horrible things. And, and then I start having sex. And it, years later, actually, you know, years later. So this happened when I was 18. I'm talking about when I'm 25. I start having, being sexually active. And I start to be sexually active with, you know, more than one woman now. And so it's like I'm experimenting. And I go, man, I like this. Fuck, I, I like this aggressive style. I like this, like, choking, this slapping, this, these, these moves, you know, that, that I see. I also like making love. I also like feeling emotion. I also yeah. like being soft. But I like fucking. I like, you know, the, this crazy aggressive feeling. Man, I'm a her- horrible person. So now I'm going to only communicate with these people with my secret self. You know what I'm saying? I'm only going to yeah. impact. And in order for me to do that, then there's this bad side of me that I can't talk about. And man, we need to talk about sex. Everybody in what you like in your sexual urge, you know, my sexual urge, everybody is an individual watching. This is an empowered point. That is you, whether you got there through, you know, uh, what people did to you, bad experiences, but fucking own that, you know, I didn't ask for a lot of the things that happened with me sexually, whether it was a mutual agreement with somebody who was really bad for me and it just didn't work and we were confused, or before I could make a fucking decision about sex and I was really young and stuff happened. Mm -hmm. That is not an excuse for me not owning who I am as a sexual person. Those things changed what I like and dislike through sex. All right. Mm -hmm. Those things shape me. Those things I like and can be what I call being sexually healthy. That means I'm emotionally, mentally and physically communicating an expression of my true self. That might be different than what would have, you know, had those things never happened. But we we need to own those things. And um, man, so much of the time we deny our urges based on being a man. And let's take the sex out of that. Let's say my urge of being a man is to have some ambition and fight for something. Now, that might be polluted by society. That might be whatever. But we're not going to get anywhere from halting that sort of drive and ambition that, yes, might be polluted and filtered through what a guy is supposed to do through society. But we need to get on that road and be okay with it to start redirecting it to where it needs to be. But if we deny ourselves and halt it, we're screwed. You know, mm-hmm. And um, just one thing, because I mentioned the porn thing, a lot of people... Um, talk about porn and porn addiction and man, it's a real problem. Porn is not real sex. You're not communicating with a real fucking human being. You need to communicate with a real human being. That's sex. But your sex problems are a lot deeper than porn. But here's where addiction comes into play. What I really have a pet peeve about is when people start talking about sex addiction or porn addiction without any experience in that. We need sex to live. All right. We need it to be a healthy, communicating person. We also need to socialize to live. All right. If we're doing sexual behavior that's addictive, it it means that we don't need to stop having sex or halt sex or sex is a bad thing. That's very different than drugs. You do not need drugs to live. You do not need that. That does not. That's dysfunctional. You can be fine without it. There's plenty of different ways to escape and yada, yada, yada. And so the idea of abstinence from certain sexual behaviors, um, man, it really sends the wrong message. Yeah, sure, we may need to lay off, we may need to stop, but your sexual insides of you need to be empowered and respected and, and, and learned. And what you need to do is learn how to look at those things and learn how to fucking communicate them to other people. And your problem is when it comes to whatever it is like... Uh, 
uh, sex addiction or even, um, you know, other characteristics of like where people are, you know, being too active or where, you know, they're like, think of it if, if somebody was too angry and we said you could never be angry again and you have to stop all anger. No, that person needs an outlet to communicate that anger so it can move into something else. That anger is there for, there for a reason. Anger is a natural human emotion that we need. Um, it's, it, it can be dysfunctional in a lot of ways, but it's got to learn to communicate and connect and exploration comes from within. Anyway, that was a little bit crazy of a rant. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's true. I mean, it's, it's, we have, people don't realize, I mean, you mentioned the abstinence thing. People don't realize how big an impact what we call morally right and wrong when it comes to sex comes from religion. Yeah. And, and whether you're religious or not, people still have those, uh, those set, that sort of vague set of morals straight out of the Bible or straight out of the Quran yeah. or straight out of, you know, our whole society, our view of sex is shaped by that. Um, and it just so happens that right now the society we live in was shaped by a patriarchal religious system mm -hmm. where, where women were second-rate citizens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, women's sexuality was something to be feared. In fact, it shouldn't exist, and it was the, it was the, the work of the devil. And, <laughs> you know, that is, that is kind of at the core of a lot of what we think about with sex and sexuality now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of guys are scared of female sexuality. <laughs> they find it Big a little time. bit intimidating. Big time. Totally. Because it's <laughs> in some ways, women are more sexual than men, you know? And, and, and it's just, but it's different. And this whole idea of abstinence from sex or sex is bad or you shouldn't engage in sex because it would be immoral to in certain circumstances, I think it's really damaging for both guys and girls. Yeah, if, um, you, if you have some, something that you think is a secret, this is the importance of a group. You need to get that out and talk about it and see that it's normal. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, need, you need to be able to own that. And a lot of times those things are sexual. I'm sure if we had a different society that shed a dark light over, you know, whatever it was, purpose, ambition, or... Uh, you know, I don't know, whatever it might be, uh, we might have more secrets towards that. But man, you are only as sick as your secrets. And it's so sad when we disempower ourselves from what we really believe and we can't, we can't speak mm -hmm. it. it. It's fucking crazy. Um, man, uh, there was something else that I was thinking about in that. But let me ask you this. When it comes to the idea of sexual objectification, you had said some pretty cool things. My, my girlfriend just made a video about it and, uh, um, you know, you had, uh, sent me a message about it, but mm. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, um, it's such a, it's such a loaded topic because, you know, on the one hand, you understand the argument that everyone makes, you know what, a woman doesn't feel like she's only the sexual being, right? And there's, mm. there's actually this almost double standard or this, this double message that's being passed to women, to, to men, sorry. And one is that, you know, you shouldn't look at a woman and make her feel like she's just a sexual object. Yeah. But then on the other hand, you get your girlfriend saying, does my ass look big in this? Tell me, I want to look pretty today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's stupid, but uh, seriously, both messages get, get passed on to us. And you've got, this, you've got this thing where there's a very small section of uh, guys, of people, of human beings who um, are completely disconnected from their emotions and like, are basically addicted to sex, right? And people in that situation are damaging. They're just as damaging as people addicted to drugs or people addicted to other things that hurt other people to get what they want. Right. And, right. And, but the reality of objectification, of seeing a woman thinking, mm, God damn it, uh, 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 there's nothing wrong with that. And, and you know, again, to jump onto research, men are actually, you, you, everyone knows men and women, women generally are better at reading body language than men. They're just their brains, the way they develop, they're much better at reading like vocal intonations and emotional state of people yeah. are communicating yeah. with. Um, I'll start off the bat, women are in general better than men. The second we're sexually stimulated, the second we quote unquote objectify a woman, we're completely in sync with what she's feeling, with what she's experiencing, with what she's thinking. We're all of a sudden, we're more in tune than we'll ever be at any other point in time. And that's, to me, that's quite instructive to the whole um, idea that you should feel bad if you've objectified a woman. Um, because for 90% of guys, 95% of the healthy male population, that's actually how we start to tune into a woman's wants and needs. Yeah. yeah. It sounds it, really it, stupid, but it, it's a part of how we work. So it's weird. So the it's definition weird. of objectification yeah. is to objectify somebody so you don't feel anything. Yeah. But when we yeah. feel, but a lot of 
critics of sexual objectification, mm-hmm. men and women, will say that when you're sexually objectifying a woman, you're then making her an object. But really in that act of us feeling what we really feel, it puts us in sync with women on a different level. And I think what's yeah. important about the point that you make is that we have a different mind when we're aroused. Mm-hmm. You know, when we make rules about sex, like, what are the rules I learned in school? Well, talk about it, discuss stuff with your partner, you know, okay, safe sex, condoms, all, all that sort of stuff. All this stuff which is good. I'm not saying it's bad. But let me tell you, when I'm aroused and she's aroused, that stuff doesn't matter. And, you know, here's, here's the fucking, here's the reality of what happens in safe sex. You have a relationship. So let's just take the issue of wearing a condom. You have a relationship where you meet somebody, you guys get aroused, you start to have sex, whether that's fast, slow, it's been four dates, it's the same night, it's been two weeks of dating, whatever it is. You know, okay, like, let's get the condom, you put the condom on, you guys have sex. You have sex, it's good. And then in that, you... Uh, you basically, uh, you know, you have fun. Let's say you have sex again. You wear a condom. Let's say a week goes by or a day goes by or you guys had one period of sex where you used the condom. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden you feel like you know each other and you're like, man, let's go for it. I can't tell you. is stupid. And that, that's stupid. Mm, but that yeah. happens. Even if, yeah. I, even if I'm the one, the man. And, let me, and this, is, this is the fucking truth, man. Uh, because this is where men and women are the same, you know, men, like they, they want to have sex right away. But if a woman is in a safe zone where she feels sexually comfortable with you, she'll be the same. You know, you'll be like, well, hold on, I got to get a condom. She's like, just fuck me. And you're like, okay. (laughs) You know, and and that situation has happened so many times. Here's, here's what logic says. Here's what would make sense. Here's what everybody would agree on that makes sense. Okay. We're sexually attractive. Science has made it possible through the use of, uh, you know, uh, prophylactics that we mm. can have sex and be, you know, safe from some diseases. And so let's have sex. We, we can do that. Now let's go to the doctor, get ourselves checked out and see what happens and da, 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 man, that shit does not happen. And so when I hear people start to talk about how to have a better sex life and communicate with men and women and how it's supposed to go, man, that doesn't fucking happen. And you are speaking out of reality. When you start yeah. saying things, especially like uh, uh, when guys will bring up and see, you brought up this, is what I wanted to talk about from what you said is a lot of times it's men are afraid of women mm-hmm. and guys who enter in the seduction scene are a lot of times that's their issue. You're afraid of women. You know, the reason why you can't, you know, sexually perform in front of a woman where you have erectile dysfunction or whatever, man, it's not just the addiction to porn. You know, I get it. I I get all that stuff, you know, the desensitization, whatever. You need to get comfortable with who you are and expressing that to a woman. And your your overall fear is much deeper than that. If you, and the reason why I say this is because, man, all the guys I know who've seen sex therapists, and at first I didn't argue with them because I'm like, yeah, this is what I do, but I'm not a psychologist. Um, Mm -hmm. But man, I have like a, I've worked with a lot of people. I've worked with a lot of people in terms of addiction as well. And and I do get this, but now I'm, I'm putting my foot down on it because I've seen so many guys work with sex therapists and they'll tell them, don't masturbate for 90 days. You know, we see this on the TED Talks and all this sort of stuff. Um, don't watch porn. Um, a lot of times there'll be regulation of dating. Don't touch. Don't escalate too much. Don't have sex. Yeah. And so then these guys will then physiologically, you know, start to get erections, start to be able to come, start because a lot of times they won't be able to complete. Yeah. They won't be able to, like, a whole bunch of issues, not be able to get it up come too quick, yeah. you know, yada, yada, yada. But there'll be something that's out of their expression of sex. And so they'll fix that. And then they'll go on to have completely dysfunctional relationships. They'll go through getting a lot of prostitutes. They'll go through uh, having sexual relationships that they're detached from. Um, you know, and that was a lot that happened with me is that uh, it was like, okay, well, now I got these skills. You know, one of the curses was getting good at pickup. It made me able to have multiple sexual relationships that I had no connection to. And then I hated sex and then I didn't like it. And then it was horrible. The thing is you have to get back to who you are and uh, be able to be open and intimate with in front of somebody. And a lot mm-hmm. of the times what society will give us in any realm, whether it's uh, learning uh, martial arts, uh, presenting yourself as a public speaker, uh, starting a business, dating, sex, is how can you do this without failing? How can you do this without experiencing um, 
you know, screwing up, losing. Yeah. And when we do that, we can only do that without being ourselves. And so we mm -hmm. learn these hacks. We learn these ways to do things which are detached from us. And then we build a dysfunction, man. You know, we're making money, but not us. We're having relationships, but not us. I'm having it's sex. It's one off the other, isn't it? It's one hack man. to come the other, come the other along the way. The man, and that's the thing is there's no, there's no shortcut. Um, I'm sure you, you said you're like a really busy guy, and I think we need to have this discussion more. And I also think that we need to have it where, uh, man, some of my guys would just love to ask you questions because, again, once again, there's also – this, uh, you know, people really liked a, liked a lot of the stuff you've said, and um, yeah. bringing bringing some very reasonable sense to uh, some some hardcore issues that aren't just around men's rights. Um, how can guys find out more about you? Um, and then I'll ask the rest of the questions later. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, look, guys can uh, guys can check me out on the website, my website. So the company I run, School of Attraction. So they can just head on over to schoolofattraction.com.au. They can check me out. Um, I've, I've written a lot of articles and, and done a lot of videos on uh, a lot of these types of topics. But you know what, man? I as well. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to have a chance to answer some of the questions if they've got them. Um, you know, if we want to chat, I uh, I, yeah, I enjoy all these little chats and I enjoy it. I mean, we these guys don't know, but you and I every, all every now and again we have a bit of a chat on Facebook. Yeah. We start to we start to argue for a case on a post someone's put up on a new article right. that's come out in research and. There's a lot of areas of, of passion and interest that we kind of share outside of just dating and pick up or outside of just men's rights. Totally. And, um, yeah, man. I'd love to talk more about some of this stuff as well. Absolutely. And, and uh, here's some things because you turned me on to a lot of stuff, but what are some things, including your own resources, that if men are looking to empower themselves better, what are, you know, what's a good reading list? What's a good, uh, you know, maybe your websites that can facilitate that? What's a good outlet for them to find how to empower themselves yeah right so um you know i you know we i don't have a lot of material on this online that's of my own at this point because we run our training programs for the men we run the trustable man.com but we only run those programs in sydney at this point mm -hmm. but i'll tell you what if men are looking to to just to explore this area themselves there's really two places i'd send them because these have been two of the most instructive books on the topics that we've been discussing today and one would be the book that I mentioned to you, which was, um, which was the myth of male power. Yep. And that was really that was a fantastic book. It yeah. really, I before that point, I had no concept of how many ways there were in which the balance of power had skewed against yeah. men. How many ways men were disadvantaged? We don't see it, and um, and that was just absolutely blew my mind. And the other book, which I found absolutely incredible, was, and I'm sure you've mentioned it to your group before, is The Way of the Superior Man by David Data. Mm -hmm. And that's still my favorite book of all time. It, you know, it's interesting that uh, you know, I've never seen a book where, and this book's written for men, right? yeah. but I've never seen a book where so many women have read it and then come to me and said, oh my God, I've never felt so typecast as a woman before, but in such an accurate way. Well, it's you know, funny my, because he also writes books for women too, you know, I mean, that kind yeah. of, yeah, absolutely. You know, my, my partner was almost kind of half angry at that point because she, up to that point, had always assumed, you know, I'm unique. I'm, I'm quite different from most women. You know, I'm very unusual. And then she reads this book and she's like, God damn it, this is me. Ah, yeah. Um, but, you know, when I read that, it, it hit a number of spots because I, when I coach the guys that I work with, whether it's in, in men's work or dating and relationships or even their life, you, if you can't get to that point where you are being yourself, being that real version of yourself, uh, being straightforward, just saying, this is what I want in the world, damn it, world, this is what I want, I'm going to go get it, I'm not going to be ashamed of who I am, you get to this really kind of uh, place where you feel good, you feel more like a man than anything else in the world could ever make you feel. And so, I mean, that was my experience. It was one of the most... Um, it was one of the most... A powerful experiences I've ever had was reading Way of the Superior Man, and then I did a whole course on it. Um, yeah, I think that. what's you know you you brought something up interesting. First off, some some guys in my group would want to argue with you on that because they uh they they're like everybody references that book. So then there's people yeah. that question, it, and there's just so many people talking from so many different perspectives that uh, uh you know we're, we're I mean like we've cultivated community so we we argue sure. and talk about all this sort of stuff yeah. but um but everybody for the most part um you know agrees with 
the idea of that we need to somehow become a better version of ourselves and anything out there that's promoting that is essentially good and yeah, yeah. uh man it it's it's all good stuff like even in that sense like uh seduction as much as we've been saying like oh here's the problem with it here's you know what's wrong with it da da da, da. the fact that that moving movement came was a good thing because guys needed to as ridiculous as it was man there's so much good about it it's like guys should be like have an outlet to say like hey sex is okay here's how to have better sex here's how to meet better people it just was a little little weird at first and and still working out the kinks but um you brought up something about your partner saying oh man you know i always thought i was an individual and here's the beauty of it is that as long as we are divided and compartmentalized and all that sort of stuff we're gonna mm. our individuality of thinking that we're different is going to build walls around us when we yeah. can unify together and say hey we're all human beings hey mm -hmm. we're all part of biology hey we're a part of this awesome fellowship of men and women that unite and da da da, da. Um, we, and then we go like, we as men have these characteristics. We have women have these characteristics. When we can unify on those things, then our true individually, in, individuality can come out because we've stopped fighting what we're trying to, you know, seek our independence with. It's a funny, you know, it's funny because I just went to Anthony's wedding and he's always, I'm an individual, I'm an individual. And Hey, I'll let him have it. You know, maybe I should interview him about that. But, but I'm always like, I'm not an individual. I'm a part of all this other stuff. Like, I don't, you know. I, I do, I'm influenced by a whole bunch of stuff. I, you know, I'm not ashamed of it, yada, yada, yada. But like, uh, through that, I can independently express who I am. And it's really good. It's a, it's a fucking awesome relief. Anyway, whatevers. Uh, dude, awesome having you. Um, any last words that you, that you want to say? Anything that you feel you left out? Yeah, one, one, one thing I do kind of want to put out there to sure. people listening. Because we've, we've done a lot of talking about what's man and what's woman. And, and yeah. to kind of talk about that a bit. One thing I just want to make clear to anyone listening is that it's, it is a spectrum. You know, while, while people tend to be skewed towards what you'd call stereotypically masculine or stereotypically mm. feminine, there are lots of people that fall in the middle or on the opposite side to mm. where, they, where, where, you know, their gender or their, their sexual appendages suggest they should be. And there is, just because it's unusual doesn't mean make it wrong, doesn't, make it, doesn't mean you should change, doesn't mean you should adapt, and doesn't mean that everybody else shouldn't be embracing it. Um, and I think, you know, while we talk about that steroid, we are only talking maybe about the 80%. Yeah. This is leaving out 20% of people who don't fall clearly under one of those poles. Yeah. And, and I kind of want to make that clear. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. That means you actually have to explore where you fall in that spectrum because it is a spectrum. Um, and, I, yeah, I think that's a big thing that I'd like anyone listening to, to get is that it's not, you're not just locked into one or the other. You fall somewhere between them. You know, and if you're a yeah. guy, you probably fall more toward the male side, but you're not necessarily. It doesn't make you True. a pussy, or it doesn't make you gay, or it doesn't make you anything. It just makes you who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's one thing that I think hasn't been mentioned. I think it's important for the yeah, guys listening. Yeah, man. I think that's really that's that's a very very important point, and I think that goes with everything that you promote of you know being that expression of you. Um, mm -hmm. dude, I, I want this dialogue to be, you know, hopefully we have more of these and we branch out of all this other stuff and it turns into a free form conversation, but man, uh, good stuff. I really appreciate it. And, uh, man, you're in a heat wave down there in Sydney <laughs> In Austin, it's freezing, right? Well, it's colder in the Northern U S so we got it good, but, but, um, yeah, it's crazy. The beauties of the internet and the beauties of unifying people, man, you're, you're on the other hemisphere and, and we're having this conversation. So good stuff, man. Um, it was a pleasure. Let's talk again soon, yeah? It's been great fun, Steve. Take care, mate. All right, cool.